We're live. We're talking about architecture right now with uh, young June Park of the School of Architecture in UH Manoa. And we're going to address one of the biggest questions imaginable in the state of Hawaii and around the country, and that is affordable housing. You know, as a part of infrastructure in a funny way, because housing has gotten more expensive, especially in Hawaii. And that's a whole long story, but it's, it's, the, it's, it's the, the landscape, the environment for this discussion because it's in crisis. People cannot afford housing. We have to find a way to build housing to afford. We have to change you know, the whole system in order to afford, provide affordable housing. You know, back, back in uh, the 60s and the 70s, it was a noble, a noble aspiration. Now it's crisis, okay? And everybody has to pitch in. Everybody is involved. And guess what? Architects are involved. And guess what? Architects have new tools. And Hyung Jun has new tools, new te technological tools that we are you know, just learning to deploy now. And architects are wrapping around those tools. So the question is, what tools do we have? What can those tools do? What problems can they solve? And at the end of the day, how do they allow architects to actually chip in their discipline, you know, their technology, their expertise? To make affordable housing. <clears throat> and let me add that I, I don't think the policymakers know about this. The policy makers should be listening to Hung Jun. Uh, the policymakers should be trying to figure out how to fund it, how to allow for it, how to take any obstacles out of the way for it so that the architects can make their contribution. Okay, so this is an important show on a crisis. Hung Jun, welcome to the show. It's so nice to have you here. Aloha, Jay. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to have a time with you. Well, uh, we already know that uh, there was a, a partial collapse, collapse of the building in Florida, Miami, Florida, which was the Chap Champlain uh, Tower South. Actually, it, it happened in the June 24 this year. Do you guys know that uh, more than 80%, I mean, that, that building, that building was completed in 1982 in Hawaii, and more than 80% of the condominiums in Honolulu are older than or about the same age of the Champlain uh, Tower South. It's, it's kind of a very big number and high number. And um, if you, uh, can you show me the slide of the, uh, the one, uh, yeah. So our Hawaii is beautiful, but the problem is it's getting old and very expensive. So the, the expensive, because of the uh, several reasons. So we already know that uh, Hawaii has a high life uh, expectancy and unbalanced uh, real estate property ownership. As you know, the currently 5% uh, of the population owns 80% of the land in Hawaii. So 90% of the population struggle to find their own pro property from the rest, which is 20%. That's and also, terrible. I want you to know that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, I mean, as a matter, as a matter of um, a social policy, that is unacceptable. And some, we have to do something about that too, aside from the architectural side of things. Yeah, in, in addition to that, uh, we have very limited job opportunities for young generation. That's why our uh, family uh, demographic uh, population structure kind of uh, bigger and smaller instead of just normal shape of the uh, structure. And also the Hawaii itself is one of uh, real estate investment portfolios for national and international investors. So it's like the price is gonna be getting, getting, exp getting more expensive and also the, our buildings gonna get uh, getting older. Then how are we gonna solve it? How are we going right. to and I think it's worth mentioning that the problems we are talking about are getting worse. They're not <laughs> static. They're not the same year after year. They're worse year after year. Yeah. <clears throat> the disparity in wealth, you know, the aging of the buildings, the inability of, of the people to buy a, a home for anything they can reasonably afford is getting worse. So the first thing you do is we have to catch up on all this. We have to bend every effort. Uh, definitely. That's why I'm introducing this uh, uh, 
kind of uh, uh, technological development made in these days. Can you show me that uh, the animation, the video that I... So what we are looking at is kind of morphological transformation uh, uh, achieved through the uh, uh, data interpolation. So which means previously computational design was known as a, a computer-aided architecture. So it was all oh, having some tools, we're gonna make a building, making some better uh, documentation out of it. But in this days, it's not limited that way. We are able to get into the uh, uh, more usage of the power of the computer, which is uh, including uh, this kind of optimization and also the, uh, uh, the augmented reality, and then the environmental simulation, and also the uh, building inform building information modeling, and so on. Okay, well, so, so what does that help you achieve? We're so talking the, about building houses cheaper. We're talking about having yeah. more units in a given space. How do these tools help you? So I'm going to get to that. So the, I show that uh, how the geometry can be uh, transformed with uh, the data driven, and then the next one I show that. Uh, that kind of idea can be expanded to change the shape of the building according to the parametric value of the each component. So, aha. Uh -huh. So, in that case, if we are able to encode those variables to the necessary uh, uh, the architectural element in terms of cost, in terms of uh, usage of the room, usage of the circulation, and so on, can you get into the direction of the cost driven optimization? So can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so the, uh, we went to the, uh, the, the site, uh, which is the uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. That uh, place is a kind of a, a struggling uh, community, which is kind of a slum because of the, uh, the poverty embedded in that society. Not only that, even though they had a, a kind of a, so-called affordable housing uh, designed by the European architect and so on. The problem is they didn't provide, they, they didn't maintain and then uh, use that kind of social context, usage of the, uh, the existing uh, family relationship and those. So we wanted to uh, get into the, uh, that, into the optimization. So in, through this, we were able to save the, uh, in, in, in theory, we saved the 22% of the total project cost. And also we were able to do the social mix regarding building unit types. And then also the, with following that uh, kind of a design advice strategies from the optimization, we were able to increase 120% of the number of the residents. What I'm trying to say is it's not just about making the columns and walls and then slab and then the, the roof, not, not this way. We want to compute the, all the information, those information getting into the transform of the ge geometry and then the shape of the building, arrangement of the rooms and so on. What does that do for affordable housing? Uh, affordable does it make housing- it cheaper? Does it make it cheaper to build a building? You're looking for comfort, you're looking for cheapness, you're looking for different materials. I mean, oh, what, yeah, are the, yeah. what are the calculations and optimization do to make affordable housing? Yeah, so the affordable housing in that case, we are able to increase the number of the rooms to accommodate the people, right? Within that given constraint of the site, size of the constraint site. And also the, as you mentioned, the cost. So in terms of, uh, in terms of material, in terms of the, um, uh, the usage of that component and the cost uh, cost evaluation estimation. And then the third one is design context. So are you going to put the living room and then the bedroom and then also this uh, the dining and kitchen, which way it's kind of combinatorial search. So the human being can do the expert uh, designer can easily do A, B, C, D combination of the one house but when you get into the bigger, into the one apart component, multiple apart components, and those, how are you going to manage all these different variations? So the, the computer is going to do this, do us, not only the computation, 
but also the simulating the design proposal. Let me see if I understand. The idea is you have so much space, so much room, so much of a footprint on the ground. Yes. And you want to put as many houses there as possible. You don't want to make the walls any thicker than they have to be. You don't mm. want the rooms to point in the wrong direction because that's wasted space. Yes. And this optimization can help you make the building more efficient, more efficient to build, more efficient to put more units in. And, and I guess at the same time, you don't want to make it uh, the walls too thin either. No, 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 no. no. They, they have to have their privacy and so forth. Yeah, sure. So, so, so I, so what happens is you put in data like the size of the building footprint. You put in the number of units you want. You put in, you know, your presumptive distribution of the square footage for each unit, and bingo, out the other side comes a plan that will maximize the number of units, minimize the number of obstacles, and uh, the size of the walls. Uh, maximize the living quality, which is important in yep. that space. And then I can get a, a thousand units on an acre, maybe, um, which is actually what Stanley Chang, who is a senator um, in the Hawaii State Senate, is trying to do uh, in certain areas here in Hawaii. He's well, very advanced. And I, he's talking about the same thing. I don't know if you've talked to him, but he, well, he's actually, he would be interested in you. Actually, this summer, I had a chance to have a conversation with Stanley Chang because he thought about the multi-scale of the affordable housing, how this can be done. One architect can do it. So the, I showed this example and then he was very interested in, but after that, uh, we didn't have uh, any uh, further uh, discussion. But yes, I, I, yeah, I, I, I really want to extend this kind of collaboration further. So the, in addition to what you just said, in terms of optimization of that uh, housing components, the more importantly, in three-dimensional generation of the buildings, not just two-dimensional map, and also the computer going to give us how many one-bedroom, how many two-bedroom, how many three-bedroom, how many studio, even those going to be computed by the machine. The machine going to, how? It's going to encode it with a government subsidy. So how are you going to maximize the government subsidy and also the profit? In that case, how many different room, room types? Those kind of things can be encoded into the building design. I'm not saying that these architects so far, um, architect is very pure designer, but at the same time, I hope architects can accommodate these uh, uh, opportunities, unlimited opportunities to enhance their capability to go further. Well, I, what I hear you saying, and I think this is a real takeaway for our discussion, is that architects are changing the way they do business. Architects are incorporating more advanced technology because this is very advanced. This, mm -hmm. is, this is not something you go down to Best Buy and buy a little <laughs> software. <laughs> this is pretty sophisticated. Uh, okay, and so that's one thing. The other thing is you are addressing a serious social problem, crisis. And the third thing is you're happy to collaborate with, cooperate with, um, and educate uh, legislators. Um, so that's a, you know, architects didn't do that 10 years ago or 20. Uh, it's only now architects are learning how they have um, an involvement in social policy. They have a responsibility for social improvement, social development. And you, you're the point of that, aren't you, Hyunjun? Yeah, and then uh, uh, let, let's move on. To, if you don't mind, we can move on to the, I mean, I'm not sure how much time I have. Can we move on to that, that uh, cost-driven example of this, uh, this project? Actually, this project was titled the optimization of the uh, building design and its management solutions on the view of uh, cost effectiveness for building users. This was uh, supported by the uh, research fund from the Sengu Hawaii. So in this project, we uh, optimize the building design strategy and its management solutions for maximizing the potential affordability and marketability of the building has been developed. So the, basically the, through this technique, you are able to see that 36.4% uh, of the reduction in its maintenance fee uh, compared to the original building. What I'm trying to say is when you, you can make a beautiful building, 
in very expensive manner. However, if you are able to kind of a, a decent building, which have uh, minimizing unnecessary cost, will provide more spaces for the people and also more convenience for the people. In that case, we are able to achieve the resilience. So, the, I mean, the, you, you talked about in the beginning about the, but this problem is dynamic. It's not just static problem, affordability issues and homeless issues and those right, very dynamic problem. How are you gonna to respond to this? Many people talk about the resilience. In my opinion, resilience response should be first, robust planning. Robust planning is we need to kind of make a plan, not only the right now, in terms of a future duration, robust planning. Second, rapid recovery. Rapid recovery means when something happened, the system should be able to respond to that issue very quickly. That has the way to be designed. And then the third one is consistent adaptation. So the, through the building design, people should be able to adapt a given situation. So, so those three things has to be resolved into the developing the design, developing the, the project. So this is a kind of one of the example that, that we did. And then uh, we, uh, at the time we went through about 17, uh, 17 uh, high rise condominiums in Hawaii, and then six uh, condominiums in uh, Florida to find out what is the kind of a, the exemplary prototype we want to follow. So it, when you do the optimization, there are two ways. One is just we're gonna do optimization from the scratch to the end, or if you wanna save your time, you wanna start with some kind of a standard and prototype, you wanna use it as a model, then try to use your problem to kind of a, a getting rich to that kind of a standard, not exactly the same. So through those uh, study of the uh, 23 uh, analysis, we were able to uh, get into the, uh, uh, the kind of building model included with the program. That program will accept kind of various data. So simply saying, based upon the analysis, you get the prototype. Prototype will be kind of managed by the data in terms of a cost, in terms of a living condition, in terms of a circulation, in terms of a hierarchy of the, the rooms and so on. So that's uh, what we did uh, with this project. And then, yeah. So it's a tall order. I mean, all these, these uh, various things, um, you know, ending with resilience and recovery and um, those things, um, they're hard to do. You really have to think around the corner for that. And um, you have to get your owner to think around the corner for that, because if he's into value engineering, he's not going to be too concerned. He just wants to get the thing built um, and let, let, let the buyers or the tenants worry about what happens in the future. Are there any buildings that you know of here in Hawaii that have already been built that, that match, that uh, accommodate these various concerns about planning and resilience? As far as, 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 far as I know, not yet. We have to get that going, don't you think? Yeah, get that. Definitely, <laughs> we have to get that going. So the the one there's a one condition. Somebody can ask a question. Oh, you know what? When we have an expert architect, he can do it. Yeah, I don't disagree. He can do better than the computer. When you have a one building, a one one house, when you have a one house, design this one. The uh, one house maybe one building. The, the architect one architect can do better. However. Let's, let's in, increase the number of the buildings. It's going to be the community. It's going to be the whole district. I think the computer can do better well, than sure, the you make it modular. You're, you're designing a, a framework and you're going to repeat the you know, essential components. But you know, one thing that strikes me uh, when I ask you, you know, part of architecture is art. Part of architecture is to you know, make a better aesthetic experience in a city, for example, make us feel better, make us feel better about our surroundings. And if you give me buildings that all look alike, you, you know, you're losing something in the aesthetic. How do we avoid losing something in the aesthetic? Yeah, that's why the, can you, can you show me that the first animation that I, that I showed in the beginning? This is the possibility of the morphological transformation by the computer. 
we can do the complexity of the design freedom. But right now, because there is a problem is very small. So that's why I didn't include all this flexibility of the design. But as you see, we can, we can get to that high quality of the design complexity. We can do it. As you see, this is the evidence. Okay, let me ask you another thing you mentioned earlier was uh, artificial intelligence. Yes. And, uh, you know, that's really the sort of the magic box. Nobody knows how far it can go, uh, but we know that it can do extraordinary things uh, and solve extraordinary problems. Where does artificial in intelligence fit in all of this? Well, there are three different areas. Uh, first of all, the most important thing is artificial intelligence in architecture is data driven. So you somehow you need to train the, uh, the machine through the existing data set. So through data set, somehow you are able to, when you do some sketches, so then uh, through the sketches, you are able to find out how this different architectural style can be applied to that kind of line drawings. Let's say uh, Zaha did kind of a mood or the uh, Con Pedersen folks uh, kind of design uh, mood. How can I just have those? So through training the machine into that different categories of the data set, machine can, with having very limited uh, information, that you are, the machine can provide those conceptual design variation at the early stage of the design. At the same time, in the middle, so through this design optimization process itself, in these days, machine have multiple outcomes. So they are trying to get into that optimization process itself. So sometimes I'm getting scary. And then the machine can take over all the things what we can do. So this, uh, yeah, that's what well, I'm Well, so that's, about. that's a good question. I mean, you pose a good question. We would, you know, the role of the architect seems to be, um, uh, you know, to feed the information into the computer uh, and then pull it out again. Uh, where where does the architect fit? I mean, I've always seen architects as critical people in our yeah, society. Yeah. They design our cities. They make our lives worthwhile. Uh, okay. What happens if we take them out of the equation? It's a, it's an excellent question. I I I believe that you already know the uh, what the test analysis is. Test analysis is like a ride a bike. So the test analysis compared to the it's kind of contrast to the uh, explicit knowledge. Explicit knowledge can be written and delivered through these images, writings, and so on. But how to ride a bike? It's not easy to, through the, all the written information, right? So the thing is, machine cannot have those data, the testing knowledge data, because without data, machine cannot learn. So for now, <laughs> those, those creativity, those testing knowledge, reside in the heart and then the brain of the architect, designer, and artist. That's what I think. So, you know, I guess uh, one of the, one of the um, questions that has been in the room here with us is who exactly writes the code? Who exactly develops the algorithms? Uh, is it you? I know it's not Best Buy. Is it you? Who is it? And, and these people are going to be very important going forward. And maybe it, if it isn't you right now, it's somebody who's like you, who works for you, uh, who is an architect uh, in, and database person uh, and artificial intelligence person. Maybe architects are going to change the way they relate to their own work. Yeah, so the, it's like a teaching your children, teaching your children that, uh, this is how to design it. This is how to develop the, uh, uh, the high-rise condominium in terms of a cost saving. In that case, how to teach, how to provide a direction, and the outcome will be different. Even the much. So the, what I'm trying to say is, so the, who's going to guide that kind of direction? I think that's the architect. That's the, uh, maybe the collaboration with the client, collaboration with the policemaker various stakeholders, they can make a decision. Then according to that kind of decision-making, artificial intelligence can support all the, all the works, but not 100% right now. They can do little things for now. Well, but it'll change. I mean, the, these algorithms will become more powerful. Um, all the processes you're talking about will become, will become more powerful. We'll be able to design things more sophisticated. 
be more responsive to the architect. Uh, oh. So uh, everything is changing. The only constant is that everything is changing. Yeah, I mean, the, in order to get to the level, I think we can exercise and advance this, what we already have in terms of design optimization. This kind of things can be more deeply applied in the development of the, of the building designs. So and then we, we can have some uh, better benefit for, for our society. Let's, let's think about the big picture. I know it's, 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 it's a very uh, honorable way to have a one decent house for the people. But at the same time, we are able to collaborate together, get into the more bigger kind of community design and then block district. And further, the bigger problem that we have, which is in dynamic status, and I think that's what we can do as a, as a, as a member of the society for the contribution. So the, uh, we luckily, if you go to the uh, next slide that, uh, that course driven, yeah. So the, that outcome of the, my research was able to kind of a basis of design of this Kapiolani residence, which has the um, kind of uh, honorable award that uh, the 2021 gold award on the affordable housing category of the 30s uh, FIABCI, the International Real Estate Federation in France. And also the, uh, the, this Capulani Regions was invited to the United Nations Habitat for a Better or One Future. So the, that's the uh, kind of a, a achievement uh, we were able to have. You have more slides you want to discuss? Uh, the last one, last one, the last one. Oh, I mean, the last two. If I have two minutes, yeah, this one is the um, my uh, doctoral students projects already done by the um, Michael Honiak. Actually, he found that oh, this this kind of a prefabricated modular design is very suitable for the Hawaii. You know why? Other areas which has the four different seasons, the, the prefabricated this modular system probably is a joint. If there is a different temperature. Then the joint gonna make some making some creaking sound, making some problems. However, the weather in Hawaii is constant. So it's the perfect condition to use those kind of prefabricate modular design system in the design of the very in a high level of the design complexity. However, we cannot use those things more and more in Hawaii because of the lack of the police making. So I hope that if our uh, uh, if our uh, politicians can uh, provide uh, kind of proactive making of uh, this, this, this kind of policies, then we are able to accommodate more enhanced technologies and then more enhanced uh, applications in, in, in our uh, state, Hawaii. That's, uh, that's, my, uh, that's my hope. Well, let's talk more about that. Um, you know, it, se it seems to me that you offer a lot to the School of Architecture. Um, that you have expectations of your students that they have to be um, akamai about these things. They they yeah. can't they can't turn aside. They can't think classically when the role of the architect and architecture in the community is changing. When the demands of the community are changing. So what do you expect to contribute to the school to architecture in Hawaii? And what do you expect the school to contribute and the students to contribute in the next generation? I, I, I sense with you, uh, young, uh, young uh, Jun, um, that there's a new generation of architects. Call them the technological architects, call them the social policy architects. Yes. They see it differently. And you're here you know, to make a contribution. What is the contribution you want okay. to make? Okay, so that's an excellent question. You know, the, in the year of the uh, Marcus Vitruvius Polio, who is the architect in the uh, Roman Empire, a long time ago. At that time, the architect was a master builder who is the kind of a medium between the god and then the emperor. He's the one who delivered this message to the emperor to make the buildings. So in that case, he was able to know that construction in terms of mason, blacksmith, and all the different issues. However, due to the, uh, ironically, due to the development of the technology, such as perspective drawing, uh, uh, created by the Philip Brunelleschi and also the orthogonal drawings used by the Andrea Palladio in the age of the Renaissance and those. And then oh, architect, oh, you know what? 
Just send the drawings. I don't need to go to the construction site. I don't need to deal with those issues. And then he's a uh, he's a uh, he's a uh, vicinity getting shrink getting shrinked and the smaller smaller. And then just oh, let's draw this one within the within my uh, within my studio. However, ironically, also the, with the help of the technology, you are able to recover the status the status as a master builder which can make a real contribution for the society. That is just a medium between the, the God and then the, the, this emperor. You can do the part of the society. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to see, yeah. Do what you can, yeah. And maybe more than you think. So, um, you know, one of the things is that Hawaii has made some really uh, awful architecture. We have. I'll give. I'll take you for a tour one day. Okay. I'll show you what I think is really, really awful. And it's a long <laughs> tour. This may. This may take several hours. Um, and the problem is these buildings that are awful uh, have a useful life of hundreds of years because they're built with materials and on locations and and costs. You know the economic considerations. They're gonna. They're gonna be there for hundreds of years. Okay. Uh, and you know I wish we could tear them down, but. That's probably not in the cards. So when you say make a contribution, you're really talking about areas where you don't have to go through the, 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 the humbug of tearing everything down, where you have green fields to work on, uh, or at least uh, places that are buildable. Okay, here's the question though. When you put all this new design into a building, and yes. you make it a building that satisfies the, the social needs and and the technical needs of the community now using all these tools using this new design concept you're talking about that building is also going to have a useful life of 50 100 150 years okay and while that 150 years is passing by there'll be new ideas new designs new tools new architects new generations of architects what happens when the buildings you're building now get old? Okay. And, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. So, well, I cannot get to that the kind of big picture, but I cannot get, get, get into the small problem related to what you just said. So one of the issues in Hawaii is a multi-generational housing. The multi-generational housing in the beginning is going to start with a nuclear family, a couple, and then they're going to have a, the children, when they, the children are getting bigger, uh, and then the house is bigger, and then the, when the children is go, went out, then they have to think about how you're going to uh, divide and then change the form of this one. So the, my current uh, research development is how the building can evolve with the, ch the change of the family structure. So as you mentioned, building can go up, and then what is the e efficient, effective manner to make it smaller, to, to make it collapse and then to have a, make an addition based upon what you started. That's why in the beginning, I called it the resilience, resilient design approach. So as you mentioned in the beginning, dynamic status, you have to deal with past, present and future at one time with the help of the computer, you are able to somehow forecast. That's what I believe. Thank you for that. That's, that really helps me, actually. Um, and my last question, if you don't mind, my last no, question please, for you please. is, you know, we made a movie about climate change and the relation of climate change to pandemics. And we interviewed faculty here and around the country, um, you know, to talk about that. And what we found at the end of the conversation uh, was always the thought that what I say as a scientist, what I say as a, you know, um, uh, an academic uh, doesn't necessarily get into the city council and it doesn't get into the legislature because those guys do not understand that they don't care. Uh, <laughs> I think they care. <laughs> they, they, they care on, on a political level, but not, not beyond that. Anyway, so, you know, the, and, and every scientist we talked to had concerns about their, um, you know, their ability to affect policy, to affect the policy makers. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found was so interesting is they said, you know, in the past, in science, that was okay. We were in science, and they were in public policy. And if they listened to us, fine. If they didn't, fine. It wasn't, it wasn't our job to uh, try to, you know, muscle the public policy. We could only tell them what we thought. 
Now, some of them came up with the notion of, wait a minute, um, part of a scientist's job is to go out there and affect public policy. Part of us, and I'm really talking about architects too, um, part of a scientist's job is to change public policy. And some of them, and this is the most interesting thing, this is my question, some of them said, well, you need to have scientists who run for office so that they will have the influence of policymakers themselves. So, <clears throat> Young Jun, what do you think about the possibility that an architect steeped in all the technology and design we've been talking about would run for office? And he'd be shoulder to shoulder with Stanley Chang and many others in the legislature and the city council. He'd be an expert in the next office. Would, would any architect do that? Should architects do that? Let me tell you something. So, uh, Jay, we already have two big warnings. First warning is um, environmental changes, climate changes, which is about, oh, science is not lie. It's related to our everyday life. And then we had a second warning, which is this COVID pandemic that, hey, look at this science and all these issues. It's not away from you. <laughs> Reality, it's just happening. Even your everyday life going to be kind of regulated, kind of pushed back to the corner. Right now, the third question is, are you gonna, are you gonna still going to ignore the help, possible help you can have from the science, technology, all these applied areas? I think it's time to reach your hand, and then shake hand in the collaboration. I think that's my answer, a humble answer. Okay. All right. I just I want to let, give you the opportunity, uh, um, Jun, um, to, um, to leave a message, a message with our viewers, a message with uh, students of architecture, owners who might you know, call <laughs> upon architects, uh, and government people who might interface, engage with architects and architecture. What is your message to them today in view of the things we have discussed? Okay, can you can I show the last the last slide that um, sure yeah so the, this is my website so which is i dot designforfutures dot com so if you visit there so you can have more information and uh, my last message is the if you allow me to use my uh, very poor Latin so this it says <laughs> it says destitutus ventis remus adhibe so in English, it's a, if the wind does not serve, let's take to the oars. Yeah, I think that's my last message. <laughs> okay, and I think I know why you, you speak Latin. It's because architecture really got a, a huge uh, start in classical days, and we're still using the lessons that they gave us. Am I right? Yes. So <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to find out the uh, future through the window of the past. I think that's what we are trying to do. And also we are living in present with the desire and hope in good manner, I hope, yeah. Young June Park, uh, professor at the School of Architecture, UH Manoa, part of the generation that's gonna change our world here in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Young June. Thank you for having me today, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>